So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, before we just get going, I just want to remind um, those that have um, attended the, via the Zoom session that we're going out live at the moment via Facebook, um, but your cameras and mics are off. Um, and also we'll be recording this session afterwards, so it will be available. Um, we've also just kept some time at the end for questions and you can ask questions via the Zoom and the Facebook chat function. Um, so my name is Samantha Walker and I'm the Museum Curator at the St Andrews Preservation Trust. Um, so just thank you all for joining us on the session or watching live on the day that we launch our digital map of the Lady Head. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with the Preservation Trust, um, we were founded in 1937 primarily to preserve the historic character um, of St Andrews. And um, over the decades, this has really resulted in the development of a historic archive and the opening of an independent social history museum in 1982. And for those that don't know, the museum is located at 12 North Street in the heart of the Ladyhead area that we'll explore today. The Trust received funding from Museums Gallery Scotland, who are the national sector body for museums in Scotland, in the autumn of last year to create this map. Um, last year, with the reduction in visitor numbers, we really wanted to make our collections more accessible, particularly those collections that provided historical context um, to the museum and its ge geographical situation. We wanted to develop the map to a point where we could engage with the wider public and start to curate it as a community. So we hope that following this event, more people will come forward with content, information and memories. I'd just like to introduce you to um, some of the people that are on the session today. So we have um, three of our volunteers who worked on the map. Um, Amy Hart joined the Trust at the beginning of this project in November 2020. Um, I've only actually met Amy remotely, so um, hopefully we can meet at the museum soon. We also have Sebastian Taylor. Sebastian is a recent physics graduate of the University of St Andrews. They're starting a master's in September for curatorial practice in Glasgow and they're very excited to have volunteered with the St Andrews Preservation Trust on this project. We are also joined by Mary Edens Maccabee, who I have met in person. Mary Edens is a student at the University of St Andrews and has been running the museum's flashback Friday posts on social media and more recently got involved in adding content to the map. We're also joined by Neil Curring dobson of St Andrews Harbour Trust, who will be speaking about the Fitzroy Barometer at 35 North Street, and also our colleagues, Dr Alan Miller and Dr Ian Oliver at the University of St Andrews. Um, the title of the event uh, is A Sense of Place, The Lady Head and Beyond. Um, and this is really because as we started to develop the map, it became clear that while the focus of the map was to be on the Lady Head area, um, this strict geog geography meant that some key sites surrounding what was known as the Lady Head would not be included. The area of the Lady Head is generally thought of as the east end of North Street, starting from North and South Castle Street. But for the purposes of the map, we have included Fisher Housen to the west of North and South Castle Street, and then also other key sites like the Kirkhill areas at the harbour, which is really the area of the oldest settlement of St Andrews. And according to our records, and um, this is the information I have, the name the Lady Head, or the Lady Heat, as it was probably more likely to be referred to, um, comes from a building that once stood in the cathedral grounds um, called Our Lady's Chapel. Um, but I've just read that in our records, so if anyone wants to correct me, that's absolutely fine. Um, the sites on the map have really relied on archive material being available in the Trust Archive. And while 21 sites have been established so far, we do hope, hope that over time, with new material and information, the map can be developed. As we have such an extensive photographic collection, the map largely links to this material. However, we have included oral archive clips and 360 images of the site as they look today. So moving on to the map, if we just um, can have a look at the, the slides, Ian, that would be really useful. Um, The map itself, um, I can put in the chat the link um, to how you can access this. Um, so the map is available on the Preservation Trust website. We have created just a small link here, a tiny URL, uh, Ladyhead um, URL, so that you can just access it 
um, without having to go through the site, but it is available on the, the Preservation Trust website also. Um, when you're on the map, you'll basically find that you can click on the pointers to open up different sites. Um, so when you click on a pointer, um, you'll find that the site should load and um, there'll be a media button. And if you click on that, it'll then load a new screen um, that will show you the media um, that you can get to. Um, on the left hand side of the screen, you can click on content and that will bring up a list of media to look at that links to that specific site. And then on the right hand side, there's also a, a more information option that loads a caption. Um, the slides don't show it very well, so maybe we can just have, I don't know if at the moment we can have a look at the map, if that's easy to do, or I can share my screen to look at the map. Oh yeah, Ian's got it here. So this is basically on the left there. These are, that's the, the list of media that's available to look at. And then on the right hand side um, of the screen, there's just a more information tab that you click on and it should bring up an image caption. And it also references the, um, the photo number um, for the photo in our collection. Um, so I think it is a fairly easy map to navigate and to, to work your way around the sites. Um, and yeah, you could just, just click through those images and um, you can also zoom in on the photographs um, to look at some of the detail, um, which has actually been really fascinating. It's not something that we've done a lot of. So I was spending quite a lot of time today zooming in and out of photos and um, procrastinating quite a bit looking at some of the sites. So, um, so yeah, this is essentially what it looks like. So what we're going to do now is, um, I don't know, Alan, if you just want to say a bit about the map, because I've probably not covered much of any of the technical detail whatsoever, but I just really how people use it. So I don't know if you want to say a bit about that. You're just still on mute, sorry. I, I thought that was a very good um, description of the, of, of the map. I think that you know one of the things that we've been doing um, in um, smart history and also in the university um, is trying to develop archive systems so we can put um, you know images into an archive with 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 metadata um, but then to be able to then kind of generate from that interactive maps and galleries and timelines and this is uh, and I think it's a nice example of that because there's, 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 you've really got some great images um, I think one, one of the things about um, St Andrews and photography is it's one of the first places to really take photography seriously. So there's some really great um, images about St Andrews um, dating back a fair amount of time. And I think it's just amazing the amount of um, work that has gone into kind of locating those and putting them up and putting up the metadata and putting them up to the, to the map. So I'm really interested to, to hear um, your volunteers speaking about what they've what what they've done to achieve that because I think it is a I mean it looks quite simple but I think you know it, it's great to have simple things um, that people can interact with and and so on so uh, yeah thank you very much thanks Alan yeah the photographs um, that's one of the things that's just been amazing to go through the collection. Um, but 75% of the collection has been digitised, so there's still a bit to go, you know, and there's some photographs actually that we would like to include on the map, but um, it's just a, in terms of access, it's been quite difficult these last few months. So again, that's something that we can look at in terms of digitising the collection and, and getting more content on there. Um, but talking about volunteers, I think that's a good point to just move on to one of our volunteers, um, Amy Hart. Um, so she's just going to talk a bit about some of the sites that um, she's been working on and things that have interested her. So over to Amy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just going to talk about um, my personal favourite um, picture and also some of the most interesting parts that I learned um, about the map. Um, so firstly, to talk about my favourite picture from the virtual map that I researched, um, it's shown here on the slide 
And the photograph was taken at Castle Sands and it shows the shipwreck of a large vessel, which is most likely considered to be called the Merlin. The ship sank in 1881 during stormy weather um, while carrying cargo. And sadly, all 11 crew members were killed. Um, the reason I like this photo, not only because it's a very dramatic and striking photograph to see such a catastrophe so close to the town and so close to the beach. Um, the poem, which is taken from the Courier, says here, their watery graves were so close to view. Um, but to me, the most significant thing about this photograph is what it represents in terms of St. Andrew's history. Um, while researching the history of the fishing community in St. Andrews, um, during the 19th and 20th century, um, there were a lot of stories from different newspapers talking about um, different deaths and tragedies that took place while fishing. And it just reminds you of the human cost of the fishing industry and how dangerous life could be for those fishermen who were just making a living to support their family and their communities. Um, so in a way, these photographs really do serve to memorialize and commemorate those from the past and as a way of keeping the history alive and the individuals who lived and work here alive in some way. Um, so the gravestone for the 11 sailors that were killed um, during the shipwreck can be found in the St. Andrew's Cathedral Cemetery. Um, and in a way, photographs like this that are accessible on the map are similar to gravestones in some ways as they mean that we can remember and honor those in the past. Um, doing research into these fishing families was also really eye-opening to me in tracing the families and the lives of those who lived and worked in the community. Um, so on the next slide, um, you'll see a photograph of a woman called Joanne Clark um, on the steps of her home at 11 South Castle Street. Um, so the building was built around the late 17th and early 18th century. Um, and Joanne was known as quite a character within St. Andrews. Um, she was quite well known. She came from a well-established fishing family and she was sell fish around Market Street in a barrow. Um, she would also wear traditional fisherwoman's clothing, which you can see in the photograph. Um, it was very kind of bright and kind of unusual clothing. But she was also known for her wit and her sense of humor. And she was one of the um, people that I researched <clears throat> while looking into the map. Um, there was a newspaper that was written in 1926, an article that was written by a young American student who visited the town and described in detail different aspects of Joanne's life and her character. And it was really interesting to read about her because in many ways it's like a snapshot of a particular time in history, a really specific time and place. Joanne was known as the last of the fishwives because when she died in 1927, by that point the fishing industry in St Andrews was already into decline. So she kind of symbolized the traditional fisherwoman in some ways through the way that she worked and the way that she dressed. And I think she is kind of representative of these kind of hardworking, well-established families that lived and worked in the Ladyhead area. Um, so being able to put a name and a face to these houses that you pass by on the street every day was really intriguing. Um, and it's like these human aspects of the map that really makes it so important because it's a way to make connections to the past. Um, so when we remember individuals like Joanne, in some ways we're helping to preserve the culture and the traditions of the fishing families. And it also shows how St Andrews has evolved over time in terms of the, fu the function and the structure of the town and also how the legacies of the fishing community still impacts the town today. Um, that's probably the most significant thing that I learned about St Andrews while researching for this particular map is how distinct the fishing community was within the town. Um, they had their own culture and superstitions and spaces that they inhabited. So for example, you have on the next slide um, a photograph of the East End Infant School, um, which was 
originally located in Gregory Place. It's a photograph on the left, um, but it was closed in 1957. Um, it was primarily a place to educate the children from these fishermen's families. And then you have other places um, like Society Square, which um, was accessed through North Castle Street. Um, and it consisted of three story tenement buildings that surrounded a courtyard. And it was kind of like a social hub for those in the fishing community. It was a place for social gatherings and also for fisherwomen to carry out domestic work. And the fact that the fishing families occupied such a specific space within St. Andrews that often was separate from other townsfolk and maintained these old traditions was really interesting to me. And again, it shows how much of the town has evolved over the past hundred years. And the way that these buildings and these spaces evolved over time, it also shows the social and cultural transformations within society in general. So, for example, the decline of the fishing industry and also the increasing significance of the university and tourism within the town. So even though the fishing community isn't what it was within St Andrews, the buildings themselves and these photographs and the stories really does help to keep the community alive even now. So I'll pass it on to the next person. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I really love that photograph of Joanne, actually. It was one that we um, came across, I think, a, a few years ago, but um, it's tiny. It's such a really small photograph. So it's great to have it digitised because you can see a lot more detail and um, you can see quite a lot of detail on the map as well. Um, so we're now going to hear from Sebastian. I'll pass you over. Thank you. Hello. Um, so uh, I... Uh, joined uh, this project um, late last year. I think I'm one of the volunteers uh, that has uh, not met <laughs> Samantha in, um, in person, uh, but uh, I was in St Andrews last year, um, finishing up my, my undergrad, and uh, it's been really interesting working on this project. Uh, my kind of purview was to go through and sort the uh, different pictures on a spreadsheet of North Street. So going through and highlighting which pictures had enough information, which pictures had clear images and flag them, um, flag them according to their usefulness for the map. Um, this was really interesting uh, because there was all of this, uh, all of the different architecture and different images and time periods as well that the pictures come from in the archive. And so one uh, piece that stood out to me as well was uh, this picture of the St. Andrew, Andrews Fisherwomen of 50 years ago. Um, and this is an excerpt from a, um, uh, it's a newspaper clipping. Uh, and uh, though the date of the newspaper clipping wasn't included with the image, you can kind of work backwards with years, which is going to be a reoccurring theme. Uh, and so it shows that uh, the St. Andrews fishermen, uh, Fisherwomen attending the uh, London Fisheries Convention, which took place in 1883 um, down in London, and uh, it would have been a really large event. So it's really exciting to see this, uh, this staged studio shoot. Uh, and because it was done in 1883, we can work forward and, and assume that the paper was published around 19, in the 1930s. And so here, this picture was really helpful, not just because of uh, the very clear image it gives of the, the fisherwomen's faces and their uh, traditional clothes, but it also uh, compared to some other pictures that have been donated or are uh, part of the archive, it has the placement of the women along with their names attached. So having uh, standing Mrs. Hutchinson, um, Mrs. Cross, Mrs. Henderson, and then sitting Mrs. Philip, Mrs. Chisholm, and Mrs. Fenton. Uh, this means that we can now put faces to the names. So in some of the pictures, when you have a uh, picture of these, these fisherwomen uh, candidly working out in the street, as you'll see um, in the next slide, you start to see it's quite difficult to identify who is who. And even if you have names on them, 
Um, identi identifying features such as clothes also vary because, of course, for the um, for the fishing convention, the fish convention, they were in, as you can tell, a quite quite different clothing. It was a, a, a little bit clearer, a little bit louder, a little bit more traditional, a bit um, uh, closer to um, what we might call the the red shirt school of photography, uh, or uh, a less cynical version of it would be the, this idea that they were dressing up to go to this um, convention that would have been such a such a huge thing. Um, and so here we see uh, Mrs. Lorimer and uh, Mrs. Chisholm, um, circa 1900. Um, and uh, this is taken on North Street, so it was one of the pieces that I reviewed as, uh, as I went through the photos for North Street. And you can see them um, weaving creels on the, the wide pavements of North Street. Already you can see very, um, it's very surreal to go into these archives and see the town devoid of cars, uh, see public spaces such as roads and sidewalks used for work. Um, and uh, this is really cool as well. This angle is that you can see the Ladyhead barometer in the background. And as a former student of St. Andrews, this is some place that I've walked past a, a thousand times and going, uh, learning through the archive, it was really cool to suddenly start learning more about these pieces that I took for granted when walking by. Um, and so Mrs. Chisholm was uh, visible in the first photo and is visible here um, sitting on the right. Um, and uh, if we go into the next slide, we'll, we'll do another recomparison of faces as well. So this uh, photo was entitled Busy Hands. Um, and here we have in the center, um, Mrs. Kirk, on the left, Mrs. Kostorfin, on the right, Mrs. Waters, and seated we have um, Mrs. David Fenton. And uh, one of the reasons I bring this picture up, other than its wonderful composition, uh, there, there are a couple pictures uh, taken around this, this time, uh, and it's quite fun. You can watch who's uh, weaving what or who's um, working on what. But it situates them right in front of 21, one of the, um, one of the fishing family um, uh, flats, um, houses on, on North Street. That comes up and we had quite a few pictures. Uh, along this block, you had things like the out outdoor staircase, which was really indicative of the, uh, the architecture and the living space. Um, and uh, another piece that uh, this photo was really helpful in conveying was the fact that all of these women might have been referred to uh, by different things in their lives, of course. So um, here even we have uh, eight names for four um, people. And uh, some of the people have the same names, whether they were um, uh, sisters or uh, whether they married into a family. And so uh, if we go on to the next slide, please. Um, we have the, the final picture here, fisherwomen baiting their lines. Um, we see again uh, Mrs. Fenton, Mrs. Kostorfin, Mrs. Kirk and Mrs. Waters um, in a picture that you could have a, uh, a more, uh, more difficulty identifying their faces. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it was taken probably around about the same time as busy, busy hands from a different angle because we've got that 21 marker for a place. Um, and I, yeah, it was such a lovely time going through these and working for these. I, I did a little bit of research trying to figure out where the different women lived and what, what their full names were and, and putting it down was extremely hard. Um, this due to their names being different, this due to the, the photography and uh, the nature of the work, making it quite hard to tell things such as age. So when going into uh, census records and trying to sort people from their, um, from when they lived and their their age, um, it often got really muddied. So it, it brought this whole new appreci appreciation for um, people who keep very uh, clear records. Uh, and uh, it really makes you think about how nowadays, how do we uh, leave a paper trail? How are people going to, to remember um, some some narratives uh, that happened today? And so it was really, it was really exciting to go through this and um, uncover some some of the the um, uh, feminine history of St. Andrews um, in much the same way. Yeah, thank you so much.
Thank you so much for, for that. I think it is um, great that you did a lot of detective work and trying to look in the, the faces and um, figure out who people were. And we have had quite a few comments here from people that are saying that's a family member. I have photographs of family members outside 21. So it would be great to connect with people um, you know, and also just find out more about these women, because often we do have names, um, but it doesn't say, you know, like in the centre or on the right hand side or on the left. So it's never always clear. Um, but that's been one great thing about the project is actually improving our own knowledge of the collections um, and, and finding out more about um, the people that are in our photographs. Um, so thank you so much. That was great. Um, we're now going to hear from Mary Edens about um, reviewing the oral archive um, to discover some of the material um, that's been linked to the map there. So Mary Edens. Hi guys, um, as Sam introduced me, I'm a student currently at the university and I've been helping out mostly with some of the social media um, that the museum has up, but I also started to work on the map as well in, I guess, the fall. Um, so we've been working on that for a couple of months now. Um, and I know we're all really excited to get to share what we've been working on with all of you. Um, so there are a couple of different things that I um, have been working on. The first one that I'm going to talk about are the 360 images that we've just started doing um, over the past week. Um, so we have been out around the town with a, with a 360 camera, um, trying to get some good shots of places that would be already on our Ladyhead map. So on the link that Sam showed you earlier, on some sites there are obviously the photos from our archives and um, some art collection pieces as well, but hopefully we are going to get up these 360 images that we've been taking. Um, and as Sam said as well, this is, this is a project that we're going to be continuously working on and maintaining. So in the next weeks and months, hopefully we'll be able to get some more images up. Um, so always check back in to see what we've added <laughs> um, and the content that we're also putting up. So yeah, right there, that's Kirk Hill. Um, and we're going to keep going around town and taking more of those. So look out for that. Um, the other thing that I worked on, um, we have oral archives at the, at the museum. Um, back in 2016, several, several people from town were interviewed who had lived here um, since their childhood. Um, and those interviews were recorded and also transcribed. So when we were starting to think about things that we could also include on the map, um, we decided to go through those transcripts and see if there were any, any clips that we could add um, on the map that, that would have um, firsthand accounts of some of the locations that we're including. So one of the, one of the women who was interviewed uh, was Ann Morris. And you can see on the left, that's her and her family. She's up at the very top of the screen as a little girl. Um, so she, um, her and her family moved, uh, moved into 6 Balfour Place um, in the late 40s, um, just after the restoration. So you can see on the left, the background of Balfour Place. And then you can also see on the right, um, over where the Inner Harbor is, Balfour Place in the background with the St. Andrew's lifeboat in the front. Um, and Balfour Place is one of the, the locations that I worked on on the map. Um, and there are a lot of really great photos and um, pieces of art on the map that you can go see as well. But right now we're going to play a clip from Ann Morris's interview that we found. Um, so here's a piece of the oral archive um, where she's talking about her life when she lived at Balfour Place. So then Balfour Place, well, that magical uh, childhood, because of course the houses um, had been George Bruce's 
um, timber yard and so the houses abutted the water and so the Kinesburn actually flowed underneath our kitchen window, sitting room window, bedroom windows and it was absolutely lovely and the tide went in and out, in and out and it would just I have so many happy memories of that. One in particular is that on sunny days, we never closed the curtains of course and on sunny days in, when I wakened up uh, the, the water was being, the sun was striking the water and it was dappling on the ceiling. So there was this lovely pattern on the ceiling. Also, of course, terrible storms down there, you know, absolutely dreadful. My father had a great time trying to build a good garden. Surrounding the house, of course, were quite a lot of industrial things. There was the gas works, which was further along at the harbour. Uh, there was the laundry opposite, Woodburn Laundry. And there was also, um, a noise coming, the various noises. I was saying to you recently that I felt that my childhood had been much quieter. You know, the town was quieter because of course there wasn't the volume of traffic. But there were many other kind of noises. And for example, at, at eight o'clock every night, a siren went off on, which was placed on the roof of the borough school and that had been a curfew. And that continued from well into the sixties, I think. And then of course the town church bells, a hundred bells, the curfew bells. So all of these sounds were around and there was also one which my brother reminded me of yesterday about the North Car Lightship Foghorn and he called it the, when he was a very young child the moo horn because he hated it, it would uh, this horrible noise and of course it was always when it was foggy so it was very eerie you know to have this fog mm -hmm. and then of course with all the coal fires we had smog rather than you know the clear air we have now. So that's just a little clip of, of what we have on the map. Um, there are several locations currently that have oral archive clips and um, they show up on the bottom when you click on a location. So you can easily navigate um, and listen to some of those firsthand accounts. Um, and I just think as someone who's not lived here for very long, um, just a couple of years, there's been a, a very steep learning curve for me just about town history. Um, and specifically the Fisherfolk community. And the oral archives in particular were very interesting to me just because you could see how in, in the childhoods of many of these people who were being interviewed, how strong the fishing industry was in, within their life. Um, and then by the time you're hearing about where they live now, um, where they may have been throughout their lifetime, the changes that they've seen throughout town, um, you can hear the obvious shift away from the fishing industry into, into more of, I guess, the tourism um, that St. Andrews is now known for. And just hearing how that has affected locals and, and people who really saw it move as, as it was happening. So I've really enjoyed working on this project um, and I'm excited to keep going through things, keep adding, um, so that anytime you open it, there's something, something new for you to see. So thank you. Thanks so much, Winnie Edens. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've just we've got some of our um, oral archive clips on there at the moment. There, the trust actually does have quite an extensive oral archive collection, um, but some of these recordings were done, um, you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago. Um, and so we we're a bit uncertain about the copyright and the permissions and using them, but we knew with these clips that we were able to use them. Um, so perhaps over time we will be able to add more. Um, because I do think they add quite a nice personable element um, to the map, when, especially when you hear someone's voice. Um, it's fantastic. So now we are going to move on and we are going to speak um, to Neil Cunningham Dobson. Um, so Neil's from the St Andrews Harbour Trust and I'm really interested to hear what he's going to have to say about the Fitzroy Barometer. So over to you, Neil. Hi, everyone. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about an area and uh, a piece of equipment that's close to my heart uh, in the lady head and that's the Fitzroy barometer. I've been at sea for 47 years and weather is an important part of my life. For most of us it's uh, these days it's online um, on your mobile phone, internet etc. I prefer just to look out the window or open the door and go outside and have a look. However, um, weather forecasting is important, especially to fishermen. Um, it's their livelihood. 
Storms can mean that the boats don't go out to sea. Storms can also take, take lives. And this gentleman here is one of my all maritime um, heroes. And this man here is Vice Admiral Robert Fitzroy. He was born in 1805 and like a lot of people, he went and joined the Royal Navy, um, got a commission, was a, was a good officer, uh, eventually sailing with Charles Darwin on his many expeditions. And uh, Robert was very keen on weather. Um, he was also very keen on keeping records of weather and seeing how weather could be used to make forecasts. And eventually, um, he, he retired in 1850 from, from the Royal Navy um, <clears throat> and ended, ended up in the, the Board of Trade and he formed uh, the early, what is now, the Met Office. He was the pioneer of the Met Office. From all the records he kept, um, he tried to develop scientific instruments that would help people around the coast, especially fishermen, um, report the weather and forecast the weather. Um, and really, um, weather forecasting, we can trace it back to Neolithic times when our ancestors built our henges, etc., lined them up with uh, suns and stars and planets, and they made predictions about the seasons. And then it wasn't really <laughs> until the 18th, 19th century when we had um, the barometer being invented Celsius and Fahrenheit temperatures being prevented that using the combination of these instruments, it could help forecast the weather. But for centuries and still today, we still like to use um, the old ways of doing the weather. Red sky at night, red sky in the morning, or one that I use at sea a lot, a mackerel sky and mare's tail, make tall ships carry low sails which basically, if you see that part in the sky, bad weather's on the way and you would take sail down. Uh, and I still use that fairly regularly, <laughs> as long with the Shepherd's Delight. So what about our barometer then? Well, Vice Admiral Fitzroy um, was so concerned about the loss of life around the coast uh, with storms, fishermen, fleets being uh, taken away by, by bad weather that he, try to convince the scientific world that they should invent a barometer, a marine barometer, fairly sturdy one, one that could be read easily. Um, and he would hope to give these out to all the fishing communities around the British coast. He labored hard at this. And if you remember in Victorian times, here he was in a government department, the Board of Trade, which would keep meticulous records of everything that went on and all that they did. And there he was trying to work with basically um, the fishing community of which the majority were, illit were illiterate, couldn't read or write. And they were concerned about, my God, we need, we need to know what the weather's doing. We need to know that we can go out and not get killed at sea. So he managed to convince the scientific world and the government and some uh, barometer manufacturers, and he designed his Fitzroy Marine Barometer. And it wasn't, really wasn't until 1858 that he managed to get these uh, built and then sent out to uh, many stations around the UK. He used Scotland first in his trial because Scotland had worse weather than, than England at the time. So it wasn't until 1890 that St Andrews got one. Now, th this was a good 30 years after his death. Sadly, um, Fitzroy um, suffered from depression and he took his own life in 1865. However, his work continued on that he wanted to save and, and protect the fishermen of the UK. Normally what would happen is fishing communities would get together if they didn't have a, a, a barometer and uh, they would apply to the government, the Board of Trade, and one would be sent up with instructions. And we were very lucky that St Andrews got one. 
In fact, I've even got the uh, the number of it somewhere. Um, <clears throat> it was the Admiral Fitzroy Marine Barometer, serial number 367815. And it was gifted to the fishermen of St Andrews and built into the corner there, I think 35 North Street, uh, on the corner of North Castle Street there. And <clears throat> it was there for the whole fishing community to see. And it's the perfect spot for it. It was on the corner. If you can imagine in these days, the, the houses around there were full of fishing families. Uh, they were living in one room and most of the work was done outside on the streets where they would come out to talk, socialise, sell their fish, um, basically uh, get news, um, talk about the fishing, what the weather's going to do, etc. Luckily enough, they had people that could read or write and could actually read the barometers. And this consisted of a normal uh, marine barometer and a storm glass. And inside the storm glass was camphor oil. And at different temperatures, it goes cloudy or it goes light, it goes clear. Uh, and then you, from that, you could guesstimate that bad weather was on the way. So normally you would get one of the locals there that could read and write to pass on the information and keep a note off, that's a slide there, um, and keep a note off um, <clears throat> what the weather was doing. Obviously, you would go out and have a look at yourself. Um, weather's all about local knowledge, and St Andrews Bay um, has its own weather systems. In fact, I always tell people that this corner of, of the East Nook is really Shangri-La. Everywhere else, north and south, gets snow, but St Andrews doesn't. So <clears throat> they were very aware of it. Um, the barometer fitted in the wall there. Um, it's quite interesting because in the bottom right-hand corner, you can't quite see it in the photograph I've got, but if you go up there, you'll see marks carved into the wall from initials, possibly a local fisherman. They also may have sharpened the knives on the sandstone at the side there. And <clears throat> I'm quite surprised that it's still uh, in situ <laughs> and not been damaged, broken or destroyed or the building chain. So it's great to, to have this uh, barometer there. What, what was important and what, what comes out of this story uh, more than anything else was that Fitzroy representing the Board of Trade, meticulous record keepers, government, um, got together with a bunch of fishermen with the whole aim of protecting lives at sea. And I, I, I wish today that our governments uh, were like Fitzroy and the fishing communities uh, to sort out all their, their, all their issues. The barometer itself, um, was uh, the Preservation Trust fixed it up and it's now in its present state in the corner there. But if we go to the next slide, here's a picture of them all sitting on the corner there. Now, I would love to um, name some of these people on here and, and I wish that my uh, ancestors was there. My grandmother is a Cunningham and her grandmother was down at the Royal George and my grandmother's brothers and sisters all lived in the close, just opposite the gentleman, the right down there, uh, way in the 60s and the, in the 70s, they were still in there in the fishing communities. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting in this picture, it's one, to me it's one of the greatest pictures of the fishing community here. They obviously came out for this photograph, um, <clears throat> and they're all standing there. There's young, there's young boys there. There's old fishermen there, and it's the dogs that are interesting as well. Obviously, uh, a great part of uh, the fishermen's um, lives. Of course, many of the fishermen, when they weren't fishing, were caddies and club makers. So you've got that connection as well. Had there not been a harbour here and a fishing fleet, there wouldn't have possibly been all the caddies in the Gulf. Uh, the way it is now. So I always like to think that it was the fishermen that got it started. So there is also another barometer you might not be aware of. Can we have the next slide? This is on the corner, um, just before you go down St Gregory's, on the corner of the Cathedral Ward. Uh, to many, it just looks like an old post box, but it's another barometer. Um, not a Fitzroy one, uh, you can see that the long slot there would have been possibly for the um, 
<clears throat> storm glass and the top half um, would have been for a marine barometer. This was gifted by Alexander Harley Cunningham and they had a shop, AJ and Cunningham's at the West Port. And that's all I basically have found out. And they donated it to it. So they donated it um, at the same time as the Fitzroy one was still on the corner at, uh, at the Lady Head there. So we had two. So if anybody's got any information or knowledge as to why it was gifted and actually what happened to it, um, the wood's in a, in a, in a bad old state. It'd be lovely to have, um, have this uh, redone and have another um, marine barometer in there. Um, if you go around the coast of Scotland, a lot of the fishing ports, you, you will come across these types of barometers and clocks at harbours, etc. It might be a new craze that we can start of going to tick them off on a list and learn about the weather. But they still work. That, that's the thing about them. They still work. You can still go along and read the barometer there and see, oh, it's gone cloudy. As you stand in the rain, you will see that uh, it indeed is cloudy. So there we go with the barometer. That was Fitzroy. He's a bit of a hero and a lot should be, more should be said about the work that he did to protect the lives of the fishermen in, uh, around our coast and especially in St Andrews. Fishermen of St Andrews historically um, had a lot of hard times. Um, centuries ago, fleets were uh, destroyed by storms um, and lots of lives lost. So it's an important corner of the town and, and, and I love the Lady Head and I'm very proud that I have ancestors and family that are there and I'm really happy that we still have this area, the Lady Head uh, today. So seeing this map and be able to click in it, it was absolutely uh, wonderful. And that picture that I'd not seen before of all the fishermen on the corner there is, is, is remarkable. So there we go, that's me. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, that was really great. And um, you found out more than what I was able to find out about <laughs> uh, this one. So I've been kind of typing it away to, to keep a note of that. Um, but yeah, it would be great to find out more um, more about that because people do mention it and ask what it is. So, um, But yeah, that was, that was fantastic. And it is a great photo. And I've noticed a couple of people have said, um, my granddad, third from the left, is a Fenton. Um, and then another, somebody else's granddad living in the area might be in the photograph. So the great thing is about the map as well is you can zoom in to the photograph. Mm. So if people have other photographs of, you know, their grandparents, then they might be able to do comparisons as well and help us to identify the people in the photographs. Um, so that's super. Thank you so much. Um, the next few slides... Um, I was just really going to look at some of the items in the collection that um, we didn't really know much about that we have added to the map and we've been able to, um, to kind of find out a bit more about. Um, so this sketch here um, was, uh, is titled Femi and it's by Malcolm Patterson, um, who was an art teacher at St Leonard's School. Um, the sketch itself is dated 1921. Um, but we didn't know anything about the sketch apart from that information. Um, so what we were able to do is find out, um, the other thing actually that did have on the sketch was it said that she lived at Balfour Place, um, which was really helpful because then we looked up um, the census record and we found um, Euphemia C. Wilson um, living at Balfour Place in 1911. And the census record was able to tell us that at that time, um, she was 54. Um, and so with the sketch being 1921, I think it was reasonable to say um, that she was, was 64 at that time. Um, her occupation um, was actually listed as a gatherer of shellfish. Um, and for me, that just really gave me so much more insight into her life um, and the, the type of work that she did. Uh, because we know that fisherwomen played an important role um, in the fishing and um, you know, much of their working day was spent uh, baiting lines and, and looking after the home. Um, but then if they were gathering shellfish, then they would have done that three mile walk um, out to the Eden um, in all weathers, you know, freezing cold, um, a three mile walk out there and then 
uh, with the creels on their back, back to St Andrews again. So really um, tough, tough uh, work to do. So to find that out about her in this sketch just really brought that to life for me um, to find out what her, what her occupation was. Um, the next photograph, um, it's one of the few photographs that we actually have of 24 to 26 North Street and it's of Brown's sto store. Um, and that was really, again, all the information that we had of that. We didn't really know anything about the family um, prior to their ownership of the shop. Um, but again, we were able to look at the 1911 cen census um, and that told us that David Brown had been a fisherman and he'd lived at the Shorehead. Um, and then he took over the shop in 1922. Um, because David Brown is quite a common name, we actually used the daughter's name, Letty. So we started searching Letitia um, as a formal name and that's, that's how we managed to, to find them. Um, but it's a really lovely photograph. The shop now is um, North Point Cafe. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of students will recognise it because it's always a very busy place. Um, so yeah, it was great to just find out a bit more and I would be interested to find out more about that family as well and how long they had to shop for. I'm not too sure about that yet. Um, and then the final photograph that I had never seen before actually, um, that is in our collection, um, is this one from the Kirkhill and it was titled Joe the Tank. Um, so I started looking through newspaper articles about this um, and was able to find out that um, Jo was originally named the Adventuress. Um, she was gifted to the town of St Andrews in 1919 in recognition um, of the large sums that had been raised in war loans. Um, the tank apparently had been driven from the goods station at the links um, up Pilmer Place and um, along North Street and then down Gregory Place um, to be manoeuvred um, into place at the gun platform at the edge of the cliffs at the Kirk Hill. Um, and the newspaper reports say that the nose of the tank points defiantly out to the North Sea. Um, so you could just about see that in the background there actually. Um, what we also found out from the newspaper articles that the, that the tank actually sat there until 1929. Um, but the newspaper articles really say that there was a lot of complaints from residents, they felt it was very unsafe. There wasn't any railings at all. It was just a tank basically hanging off a cliff edge. Um, there were fears that children might play around the tank um, and also worried about the stability of the cliffs below. Um, so again, really great to find out the context behind this photograph. Um, just we really knew nothing about it other than the caption. And just to me, I just can't ever imagine um, a 32 ton tank um, at the Kirk Hill. Um, and yeah, Neil's just mentioned there also about the, the turret, um, the turret light on the, the cathedral wall. I think we do mention that briefly on the map. There's a really great photograph um, that, that just shows the wall and you can see where, um, where that turret light would have been. Um, and there's a couple of great photographs of the harbour actually that you can kind of just see it in the distance, but you need to know what you're looking for um, to actually identify it. Um, so yeah, these were just a few photographs that I just wanted to point out that I found particularly interesting. Um, but we've still got, you know, a lot of things to find out about our collection. These photographs have so many stories in them and we've got, you know, over 150 on the map and um, over 12,000 in the archive. So um, finding out the context of these photographs just um, really brings them to life. Um, so on that note, I would just like to say when you are exploring the map and having a look, um, you know, if you have information um, or any other content, please do get in touch. Um, I think my email address will be at the end of these slides. So it would be great to hear from anyone that has um, any further information.